Hi, I'm Dr. Ali Hushman. Rowan University is committed to educating the public about the importance of higher education in our state and region. That's why we are proud to support the important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Rowan University, educating New Jersey leaders, partnering with New Jersey businesses, transforming New Jersey's future. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Englewood Health. NJM Insurance Group. The Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ. And by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Promotional support provided by ROINJ, informing and connecting businesses in New Jersey. And by NJ.com, small news, big news, true Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. More importantly, we are in Atlantic City. This is uh, the NJEA 165th convention. Uh, these folks have been getting together for obviously more than a few years. So in this half hour, you're going to meet educators. You're going to meet uh, officers from the NJEA. We also talked to the Commissioner of Education, the keynote speaker here, talking about issues that matter to our children, the students of today, what it's like to be an educator uh, in today's classroom, new technology and the impact that it's having, issues of race, issues of uh, diversity and inclusion, all kinds of issues that impact our children, your children, my children, and the great teachers who teach them every day at the NJA convention. It's our pleasure to introduce the vice president of the NJA, Sean Spiller. Good to see you, Sean. Good to see you, Tip. Tell folks about your teaching background. You started when and why? Oh, a number of years ago now. Uh, it goes by so quick. What area? Uh, I, science, uh, high school science teacher, anatomy and physiology, and started in Kinelon, New Jersey, and ended up in Wayne for a uh, majority of uh, 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 the time that I've been teaching. And love it. Love every minute of it. Uh, love the kids. Love what I do. It's uh, one of the greatest professions in the world. We should also make it clear that Sean and I know each other from the same home town, if you will. You, you recently became the deputy mayor deputy of the great mayor. town yes. of yes. Montclair. That's right. Now I can marry people. So if you now know you anybody can, that, uh, uh, yes. I, I, I plan on staying married. And I also <laughs> will not... And I will not bring up property taxes in Montclair. Oh, fair enough. Fair Is enough. it fair to say I that? I pay them too, so I, yes, I got it. <laughs> people bring that up in town. Yeah, don't yeah, they? yeah. You I will a stay bit. off that. Let's talk education. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, this convention. Yes. Social justice is a big theme. Some might say, why are we talking about social justice with educators in public schools? You yeah. say? I think we have to be. Uh, you know, we educate kids every day, and every day those kids come in. Uh, they want to learn, they, 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 they're excited to, but they come in with uh, a lot of challenges in many cases. And a lot of that is that social justice work, that, that education justice, which leads to student success, which is that theme that we have for the convention. Uh, because we understand that if we're just uh, closing our classroom doors, just trying to bring out those textbooks and hopefully teach the kids something, we're missing a big opportunity to make Define sure that kids can be Define social justice for people who say, yeah, I know the term, but... Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that, because it's, I think it's different. It's not always the same thing. People don't exactly understand what it means. I think but more broadly, it means fighting for uh, uh, something that's right against something that's wrong, making sure everybody at least has that fair shot, that fair shake at success. Uh, we talk about the American dream. We know that starts with uh, a great education. Uh, and how do we remove barriers to uh, a student being able to come in and learn? Does that mean they've got to have food if they need it? Does that mean they've got to uh, have support for their parents if their parents are in need? Does it mean a number of different things? That social justice can mean so many different things to so many different people. But at the core of it, it means making sure that our students have an opportunity to come into our classrooms and to learn. Sean, help us understand this. You've been teaching for a few years. Yeah. The profession has evolved in many ways. Sure. The biggest change is? In a bad way, a lot more paperwork and, and uh, check the box type things where people who aren't educators have come in and say, uh, under the banner of accountability, which we all want accountability, but have come in under that banner to say, we're going to try and standardize. We're going to try and make sure everyone does this the same way. We're going to check on that by making you fill this out or document that. And I think it's really gotten us away from the art of teaching. You know, there's a real art to it. Uh, and allowing educators to have a little creative space within the framework of, of certainly the curriculum and what students have to learn, 
but uh, I'm a professional, we're professionals. Let us do our job, let us do what we've studied for, what we've uh, really gone into this career because we're passionate about. But you know, it's interesting, I, I thought you might go in a different direction, particularly given your background in science. Technology. Yeah, big changes. Dramatically changed, not just the way students learn, but how teachers must teach. Yeah, how absolutely. So? Well, I'd say. And give us an example. Yeah, well, the interesting. Well, let's pick an easy one. You know, we've gone. You know, smart boards became a thing after projectors were a right. thing, which were a thing after chalkboards were a thing. Right. That that. Kind no of, transparencies that, anymore. Yeah. No more. No <laughs> more. You know, which probably to everyone's benefit. But yeah, right. Yeah, those those changes do always occur, and I think they're great. There, there's so many cool things you can do now, and the, and the kids are always ahead. You know, they 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 right. get it. They know it. But I still think at the core of it. It's the same, you know, you do have to learn it. You have to keep on top of it. You've got to keep evolving. That's a lot of what we're doing here at the convention, making sure people stay up to date. A lot on, of workshops, on professional development. A lot of workshops, a lot of high tech hall and everything right. else that you see. Um, but it's still teaching. You know, you're still using something to maybe put, present it in an interesting way or have kids uh, uh, find something out in a different way. Is it human interaction but, still? Uh, there is, I think there I is. I'm a teacher and student. Yes. And is it harder, sorry for interrupting, Sean. Yeah. Is it harder to keep the attention of students today. I, I'm, I'm thinking about our kids in the dinner table. Yeah. I mean, no tech. Yes. Get the technology out of there. You can't, and, and in a classroom, I, no, they're not using the technology when they're not supposed to, but, long-winded question I know, is it harder to keep their, get it and keep it? I, I, think, I think it is. I think that's why I pause a little bit, even in that technology is a great thing. But I think we all see those challenges. I'm sure as parents, you know, you see that challenge, but also as educators, uh, it's an exciting piece where you can introduce something or use technology, but there is that risk that students are so used to uh, an instant uh, result on, on technology keep use. Keep me entertained. Keep me entertained, you know, and, and that was, that's always a lot of what, you know, teaching was, was to make sure students are entertained, right. but uh, that bar with technology is so high now that it's just tough to be um, tough to be something that captures that. But you also use it in the classroom. Absolutely, you have to use it in the classroom. It's I mean, a tool. It, it's a tool, and it's a it's a very useful tool. And if you're not ahead of that curve, you're you're you're, you're being left behind. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, <laughs> Mr. Vice President. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. Much appreciated. Well Always done. good to see you. What happens when you come to the NJA convention? You meet the Teacher of the Year. That's right, we got her. We had to go through her people, but we have her right now. She's Jennifer Scomial. Yes. Who is 2018-2019 uh, New Jersey State Teacher of the Year and Career and Technical Education Teacher at Morris County School of Technology. How are you doing? Amazingly well. <laughs> and by the way, when you found out that you were the Teacher of the Year, you thought, what took so long? No, <laughs> I thought they've got it wrong. Come on. <laughs> I did, so I got an email that said, sorry, but not, not you. And then the commissioner came to my school and they pulled me into a meeting. The commissioner of education? Yeah. Go ahead, they, and, I'm okay. sorry to interrupt, go ahead, tell the so, story. So I get called down to the superintendent's office. He says with a very serious face, but there was something behind those eyes and he said, you need to come into this office. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm the wrong one. He says, just come into this office. I said, no, you don't understand. I got the email, it's not me. He says, I'm telling you to just walk through that door. And when I walked through, the room was filled with people, but the commissioner of education greeted me, and it was amazing. What did it feel like? Well, first, after I convinced him that it wasn't me, <laughs> and he convinced me that it was, I just, I, I just still believe, you know, that I'm here to represent all of the amazing teachers, so it's easier to say that than it is to think, like, you were the one chosen. Yeah. I'm just here to represent everyone. Were you born to be a teacher? I think so. Because? I think there is something within you that makes you the one for something like this. Like, I don't think I could be in any other career path. I don't think I could wake up every morning excited to go work with my students. I think that this is why I'm in this career path. It was just something within me. Uh, hold on, uh, you, you were babysitting, you started doing some tutoring. Oh, well, you do all of those things just because it gives you more experience with different age groups and different, you know, but different you things. But you knew you were oh, yeah. going to be That's why a public I did school those, teacher. That's why I did those things. And every chance I got, I would try and make those children play school with me. No, you <laughs> to, to the point where one of the families had to say on the side, my kids are exhausted from <laughs> school all day. Can you not make them play school with you As anymore? As a babysitter, you did yeah, that? Yeah, it's embarrassing. We laugh about it now. Oh, but, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we could use you at our house. Um, <laughs> they need some help. L let me try this. Your teaching approach, as I understand it, focuses a little bit less on what goes on in the classroom and more on getting students ready for quote unquote the real world. 
Okay. What does that mean? Break it down. Give us an example. So, okay, so because it's a vocational school, our students have hands-on experiences all the time for the vocation or the career path that they want to go into. So in my case, my students know they want to be educators. And some of that means, you know, social work, psychology, but primarily they want to go into teaching. So in our classroom, we attach to our classroom, we have a preschool lab. And my own daughters go through the program, so they get to go in, my students teach the actual preschool that's going on. Every day they develop lesson plans, all the activities are from them. And I'm there as a mentor and as a coach to make sure that you know, they're learning how to work with that age group, how to develop the lesson plan. and So every day they're getting that hands-on experience to prepare them for this career. What's it like seeing them grow? Well, I've already now gotten some students who are getting real teaching jobs, so they're, they're contacting me. Now, I'm old enough to have that happen What now. is that like? So they call and they say, guess what? I have a, you know, a third grade teaching position in this town, and, and it's like, wait, what? Did I, and, and then I think, you know, that's great, you work so hard, and they say thank you to me, and I'm just, it's not me, it's, it's really it's their rewarding. hard work. It's so rewarding, it's so rewarding. Number one challenge being a really good public school educator is? I have to be honest. Not, this is public television, you better okay. be honest. Um, the parents are, are a challenge. The kids are easy. I feel like working Hold with on, people are easy. Hold on, you're talking to one right here. I know, and guess what, I'm one now too. Go ahead. I have a kindergartner. And so already <laughs> this year, I've had to send in a note that says, I threw out my daughter's homework, can you send home another copy? I've had to say... You my, too? Yeah. <laughs> I've done it. My wife has done it. Go ahead. We had company coming, so I cleaned house. And yes. And there goes the homework. Um, but I've had to say to her, you know, my child's going to be absent, and then revoke that. Oh, sorry, things change. And I'm like, I'm the annoying parent. But I, I, the parents are, it's just different. And we're with their kids all day long, and we have a different approach than what they have at home. So sometimes we don't always see eye to eye. But I have to say, that's a very small percentage. So why don't you do this? Why don't you give some advice to parents? Okay. In all seriousness, as the teacher of the year, you would know best practices for a parent really wanting to help his or her public school child, student, do well, and they want to engage the teacher. Okay. So I think, number one, you have to believe in the teacher. Like, we're trained, we're devoted, we're passionate. We do what we do because we love it. And I think there's a very small percentage of teachers that you might have trouble with, but for the most part, I think that they could give us the benefit of the doubt. And, you know, like I have to say, I have amazing parents that are very supportive as well. But I would think if I look at the whole job, that's probably my most, my biggest challenge. Before I let you out of here, when you became Teacher of the Year and the commissioner surprised you, mm -hmm. and you went home and told those closest to you who have known you from the beginning mm -hmm. and how committed you were to wanting to be a teacher, what was their reaction? Oh, they, they were not surprised at all, which made me more surprised. Hold on, they weren't surprised oh, that you like, were the teacher of the yeah, year? Yeah, they're like, of course you are. I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> I don't think you heard what I said. I was like, the New Jersey State teacher. They're like, mm-hmm. So wow. they've all, my family and friends, they're so supportive. They believe in me more than I believe in myself. So for, for them, they were like, yeah, okay, and what's next? That's awesome. I said, I don't know what's next. I just have to get through this. On behalf of all of us who owe so much to public school educators who've done so much for our children, thank you, who, uh, as Teacher of the Year, represents tens, hundreds of thousands of others. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate that. To watch more Caucus New Jersey, find us online and follow us on social media. This is Steve Adubato. We are in Atlantic City. This is the 165th. New Jersey Education Association Convention. We're once again talking to the executive director of the NJEA, Ed, Ed Richardson. Good to see you, Ed. Good to see you, too. Thanks for being here, Steve. Uh, every year we've come here, there's energy, there's excitement. What makes this year particularly special? Um, I think just the fact that um, our educators feel a new mood in the state, really from the top, from the leadership of Governor Murphy. Uh, our education commissioner, Lamont Repolet, is here. The other thing that is, I don't know if it's different, Ed, but the conversation that's so critical. You and I talk a lot about the state of quote unquote political discourse in our state, in our nation. Your organization put out a very public statement about the tone of public discourse, its connection to violence, and the role of educators in that regard. How important is improving um, and making more civil, if you will, our political discourse? 
It's, it's so vitally important from a, a policy standpoint. We have challenges that we face in New Jersey, across the nation. We will never be able to address those challenges unless we learn how to talk to each other in a cooperative and respectful way. There will always be issues of disagreement, uh, whether it's across party enemies? lines. Are we enemies? When we disagree, are we enemies? No, we don't have to be. Uh, Why are we so often? Why do some believe you are my enemy if we disagree politically? Um, I think some of it is driven by the, the tenor of elections. And, you know, how we, just, way, we just We just finished the midterm elections. We we're taping right after that. Talk about uh, contentious. Um, very contentious. And the, and the nature of, the, um, uh, of all the advertising and so forth. And, okay, that's part of the campaign. But we have to learn how to move on from that and work with whoever is elected and not be working just to plan for the next election, which unfortunately I think is happening in a lot of the policy debates. It's, you know, what can we do to uh, make sure that we have a sound bite for that next ad in two or six years? But what's the role of, edu of education and educators in all this? That's the really difficult thing. Our members are out there teaching our students about how to have respectful uh, discourse about how to discuss ideas and debate them even when we disagree and still be able to you know come out as friends and at least as uh, as, as peers respecting each other's point of view respect each even other. if we disagree even if That's we disagree role of an educator I think so yeah parents of course as, as well families but um, so there we are trying to teach our kids uh, those values and, and yet, what do we what see, they adults? see uh, <laughs> from the adults who are, right. are leading our nation is a, a way different kind of a, a, a dynamic. And so that is the difficulty for our members here. How do we navigate uh, that, that difference? School safety. We talked about the, I know where the organization is when it comes to putting guns in the hands of teachers, even well trained, against it. Against it. Can we talk school bus safety? The horrific accident that happened um, with so many children at risk victims, if you will. What are we doing there? So uh, we were among uh, the very first organizations 20 plus years ago to call for seat belts in school buses. And the state ultimately adopted a statute. Uh, New Jersey was one of the first to require them. We're now talking about three-point safety belts in school buses. Or explain to folks what that means. Three Basically, right now, the belts that are required are the, are the lap belts, which um, you know anybody who's been around uh, as long as I have remembers that was right. the standard in passenger vehicles. Not anymore. Um, not anymore. You get in you a car now, too and much. it's natural. You have a three-point seat belt coming from. Why shouldn't our children have that in a school bus? So that is uh, one of the policies. What's standing in the way of that? Um, it's expensive, obviously, but um, you know you can't put a price on, on uh, the safety of our students. Uh, the tragedy that you referenced not only uh, affected children and their families, but we did lose one of our members in, in that accident. And so um, you know everybody is affected here. And, and so I think we owe it to our children, our families, our educators to uh, provide the very best safety equipment we can on, on, the, on the buses. We had the president of the state senate, uh, Steve Sweeney, talking about his plan to gain, as he believes, more fiscal responsibility in the state. And he did bring up, and you know this, going back and revisiting the question of public employee pensions, health benefits, you say? We've come to the table. We've had extensive conversations with the administration and developed um, a host of cost-saving uh, uh, solutions that are right now being implemented. So um, not to get into the weeds on this, but a new uh, plan for uh, uh, education, education retirees that will save the state $180 million a year. Um, we went to the table uh, a few years ago with the senator's help because we needed legislation for this to change the manner in which the state bids its prescription program. That resulted in a $1.5 billion savings over three years, and we're about to go back and rebid it to try and, and uh, reap even more cost savings, probably in the neighborhood of 100 to 150 million a year. There, there are things that can be done to improve the way insurance is procured and delivered and the way healthcare is, is delivered to uh, reap huge savings without automatically diminishing uh, the level of benefits that people pay. The other issue that we have is as a result of a law passed in 2011, 
We have members all over this state, educators, who are taking home less net pay from one year to the next. And the reason for that is the law required certain levels of health care premium sharing, and um, they are now exceeding any raises that people are getting. So, you know, you get a small raise over here, but your health care premium goes up by this much. We've got to end that. We cannot continue to have negative net pay year over year over year. Ed Richardson is the executive director of the New Jersey Education Association. We're here at the 165th NJA Convention in Atlantic City. Ed, thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. We're pleased to be joined um, by Dave Ellis, global conversation catalyst and founder of Dave Ellis Consulting. Good to see you. It's good to see you also. This is a very important study, uh, the study around adverse childhood experiences. That study told us what about the experiences of certain children and the impact it has on their development, on their lives. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about anything from uh, domestic violence in the home. The original 10 were around five types of household dysfunction, three types of abuse, two types of neglect. We know now that there are even more. Mm. So we're talking about things like homelessness, food insecurities, bullying, those types of things. Um, and to be really clear, lots of folks ask the question about poverty and is poverty an adverse childhood experience? The research says it's not that poverty in and of itself is not an adverse childhood experience. But we excuse have, me, but if poverty causes food insecurity... It's the food insecurity that causes the problem, right? So what we're talking about is, is that being poor in and of itself, it will exacerbate not having enough food. Mm. But just being poor, I grew up dirt poor. Tell folks, you were telling me before we got on the air here in Atlantic City. You grew up in a fascinating place. Talk about it. Where was it? Yeah, I, I grew up on the Illinois-Kentucky border, a little town called Shawneetown. It is the farthest point north that slavery existed in this country. And so it, it sits right on the Mason-Dixon line. When I go home, I feel like I'm in the deep south. And so, yeah, I've, I have an entire history of those types of things and growing up extremely poor in rural America. But adverse childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. You understand it not just from a, um, an intellectual point of view, from a, a point of view based on studies, you understand on a personal level. Very much so. Talk about that. One of the things that we know through research and just through general experience is that unless we start to do our own work, all of us are carrying something. You can't grow up in this country and not carry some type of trauma, some implication of it. And unless we're willing to talk about that, and to work through that, we get hung up trying to help people when we haven't even done our own work. And it's really hard to do, because our stuff gets in the way. For me, I've been, it, it wasn't until I was 60 that I found this study, right? And so I've spent the last few years, I'm not gonna tell you exactly how old I am, but the last several years working specifically to move this information from a research platform into the community so that the people who are most impacted get the same information that the professionals get. We train professionals all Which the time. Which is why you're here presenting. That's right. To these educators, mm -hmm. to do what for our children? <laughs> Not just the children, children, families, and communities. We always want to talk about kids right. as a singularity. Kids don't exist outside of the context of family and community. So if we're going to talk about them, let's talk about them in that context. I'm here to give people an opportunity to begin to explore, to hear what does the research say, and then explore where am I in my own journey. It's not about how can I do all these things out here. It's about how can I focus in here, help deal with my own stuff As so that educator? I am better. Yes. So that I am better prepared to deal with those kids coming in. You're asking educators to go deeper inside and, and examine their own childhood experiences? Yes, I am. In an so part of my role here is to provide the training and to give people an opportunity, because I think most people want someone from the outside to come in and give them answers. And that's the way we've always done this, right? So that's come in and tell thing. me what to do. No, that's not my thing. My thing is to come in and let's talk about it. who knows the, the kids in New Jersey better than anyone else? These people teachers. right here in New Jersey. That's right. And so the answers are sitting right here. I'm the guy that helps bring out a way that's right. for people to have the dialogue. We're involved in an initiative called Right From The Start NJ. The website will come up as I'm mentioning it. Birth to three, how critical? Absolutely critical. 85% of all brain development happens prenatal to three. 
So if you stop and think about that, when children are born, you've got nature and nurture, right? So they have everything they need right from the very beginning. Four things, basically. Eat, sleep, poop, cry. That's what mm. they do. Everything else from then on is an experience. And so there's an overwhelming amount of experience that comes in. The things that they experience the most is what gets hardwired into the brain. Now, I did not say good or bad. I said hardwired. what gets experienced the most is what gets hardwired in the brain. Whatever that is. Whatever that is. I want to thank you for joining us here in New Jersey, here in Atlantic City. Thank you for asking me to be here, sir. Our pleasure. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Rowan University, New Jersey Sharing Network, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Englewood Health, NJM Insurance Group, The Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, and by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Feels like I've opened my eyes again And the colors are golden and bright again There's a song in my heart, I feel like I belong It's a better place since you came along It's a better place since you came along